Good morning. Um, this week's reading is going to be focusing on um, a biography. Now, a biography, as you all should know, is a story about someone's life. And this biography, this person's life we're going to be reading about this week, um, kind of goes along with our social studies assignment um, because this man is very important in um, what we're talking about in social studies with the um, time period slightly after um, the um, American Revolution and the founding of our country. And this biography we're going to be studying about, we're going to be actually taking several texts that we're going to kind of combine into one. And I want you, as I read, to be thinking about the important things that you can remember about this man. His name is Andrew Jackson. And we're going to be studying about him through a couple of different sources. The first source, and this will be part one today, is from a series of books called Getting to Know the U.S. Presidents. And um, it's about Andrew Jackson, who was our seventh president. And... Um, I'm going to read part of the book today, and then I'll continue um, the rest of the week with some other resources as well. Um, I'll try to do this and let you see some of the pictures as well. Um, this is a portrait of Andrew Jackson on this first page that's housed in the National Gallery in Washington. And the portrait was uh, done by James Barton Longacre. But anyway, all right, here's the first, first part. Andrew Jackson was the seventh president of the United States. He was born in the Waxhaw region, an area along the border between North Carolina and South Carolina in 1767. And that's kind of um, one of the debatable parts about Andrew Jackson's history is sometimes you'll hear that North Carolina claims him as being born in North Carolina and then South Carolina sometimes will claim that he's been born in South Carolina. But it was a general area that was kind of located between our two states. Jackson was one of the roughest, toughest presidents ever. So... Get in for some, uh, get ready for some surprise uh, information here. He was, he was a very unique character. All right, this is a painting showing a rural area in North Carolina in the 1800s, and that's the illustration for this next page. It's kind of illustrating the area in which he was born. Andrew Jackson was the first president to grow up poor and without an expensive education. The first six U.S. presidents all came from pretty wealthy families. All except George Washington were highly educated, too. And if you'll remember when we've talked about George Washington, he, he did sort of educate himself. He, he did like to learn as well. Um, this next illustration is an engraving of a log cabin that may have been the birthplace of Andrew Jackson. And here's that illustration. The Waxhaw region where Andrew grew up was a rugged backwoods area. At that time, the Carolinas were part of the 13 colonies in North America that were ruled by Great Britain. Andrew lived in a log cabin with his mother and two brothers. So he was growing up during this time of the American Revolution. Now here's a rather interesting little cartoonish um, illustration here. It says, well, boys, what does your brother Andrew have to say about this? Uh, maybe it's better if we don't find out. It kind of gives you a little clue as to his type of personality he had. Andrew Jackson's father died just a few days before Andrew was born. Mrs. Jackson had to work very hard to raise her three sons alone. She hoped Andrew would become a minister someday. She saved every bit of extra money to send Andrew to the best school in the area. Andrew didn't really care about school, though. He was a good reader, but was more interested in running and jumping contests, horseback riding, hunting, and especially fighting. Worst of all, hot-tempered Andrew Jackson swore a lot. Shame, shame, shame. Um, hot-tempered is a word that's used for someone who gets angry really quickly. Um, here's another painting of the first battle of the Revolutionary War that began in Lexington, Massachusetts. And 
That's the illustration for this page. Andrew Jackson grew up during a very exciting time. In 1775, when Andrew was eight years old, the people of the American colonies began fighting the Revolutionary War, a war of independence against Great Britain and the King of England. We all know about the Revolutionary War because we've studied about it a lot. By the time British soldiers reached the Waxhaw region, Andrew was 13 years old. Andrew and his two older brothers volunteered to join the American army right away. Um, so this illustration shows a young Andrew Jackson watching a British attack, and this, um, this painting as well. During the fighting, Andrew and his brother Robert were captured by British soldiers. An officer who wanted his boots cleaned demanded that Andrew do the job. When Andrew refused, the British officer slashed him with his sword, leaving bad cuts on Andrew's hand and face. Not very nice. Um, this is a print called The Brave Boy of the Waxhaws, and it shows Andrew Jackson refusing to clean the boots of the British officer. And here's that illustration. Here's the next illustration, um, the, which is the British surrendered to General Washington at Yorktown in Virginia. That was an illustration of that. Andrew Jackson never forgot this. He hated the British for the rest of his life. The Revolutionary War was very tragic for Andrew Jackson. By the time it ended, both of his brothers and his mother had died. At the age of 15, Andrew was both a war veteran and an orphan. So this was quite young to be on your own and already been in a war. Andrew Jackson spent his time as a teenager moving from relative to relative. He started hanging around with some bad kids who liked to do things they shouldn't do, like gamble and play pranks on people. One of their favorite pranks was to dig up an outhouse and drag it to an unexpected place. Now, we talked a little bit about what an outhouse was. It's where people would go to the bathroom, and it was like outside the house. That's why it's called an outhouse, and anyway... After a while, Andrew figured there must be something better he could do with his life, so he decided to return to school. Andrew studied hard and even ended up teaching for a while. Um, and this is um, kind of an illustration here with the outhouse. It says, hey, what's going on here? Oops, sorry, Sheriff, we thought we had an empty one. Kind of gross. Um, eventually, Andrew became a lawyer, and in 1788, when he was 21 years old, he headed west to make his fortune. Andrew thought he could help bring law and order to the untamed wilderness areas of Tennessee while helping settlers start up their new businesses. Andrew rented a room in the house of the Donaldson family in Nashville, Tennessee. And here is a portrait of Rachel Donaldson there. Y'all see I have a little friend here while I'm videotaping. Look, oh, she's sleeping. The Donaldsons were one of the richest families around. It wasn't long before Andrew fell in love with one of the Donaldson daughters, Rachel. Rachel was beautiful and was a great horseback rider and a singer. Rachel even smoked a corn cob pipe. Kind of interesting. In 1792, Andrew and Rachel got married. Andrew became a successful frontier lawyer. Because a lot of the people he helped didn't have money, he was often paid in cotton, whiskey, slaves, land, or farm animals. Andrew and Rachel were able to start up a large plantation. Backwoods settlers really appreciated Andrew's help and the fair way that he treated them. After a few years, Andrew was elected to represent his state in Congress. He later became a judge in the Superior Court of Tennessee. Andrew Jackson ran his court in a tough, no-nonsense way. He settled problems quickly, and he usually kept a pistol or two by his side. Because of his rugged frontier upbringing, Andrew Jackson was used to settling his problems with a gun. Andrew Jackson's talent for fighting came in handy when the United States went to war with Britain again in... 1812, the War of 1812, that's what we're talking about with our social studies. 
For years, the British Navy had been stopping American ships and kidnapping sailors for its own crews. Remember what that was called? It was called impressment. At that same time, American settlers were beginning to move into areas where American Indians lived. The British started supplying some American Indians with weapons so that they could force American settlers out of Indian territory. In 1813, Andrew Jackson was asked to command an army of volunteers to defeat the Creek Indians. Even though Andrew had bullets left in him from a previous duel and a tavern fight, he and his men beat the Creek Indians badly. Two of Andrew's volunteer fighters were the famous frontiersman Davy Crockett and Sam Houston. After fighting the Creeks, Andrew Jackson led his troops to victory in what would become known as the Battle of New Orleans. Andrew knew that he would be greatly outnumbered by British soldiers. He quickly gathered some of his best and most unusual fighters to help his army of volunteers, former slaves, Creoles, and backwoodsmen. And here's a painting of the uh, Battle of New Orleans illustration. He also had wealthy businessmen, Indians, and even pirates that all offered to help General Andrew Jackson. Many of these volunteers with the best shots around, that meant they were good with their guns. By the time the fighting ended, the British had lost almost 2,000 men. The Americans had lost only 13. Andrew Jackson had won an almost impossible battle. He suddenly became a national hero. Because Andrew Jackson was such a courageous military leader and always looked out for the safety of his troops, his men nicknamed him Old Hickory. Hickory Wood was the toughest living thing they knew of. It wasn't long before some people began to think Andrew Jackson would make a good president. So he was known as Old Hickory, and that would be with capital letters. All right, we're going to stop at that point for today. And we will continue with his uh, run for the presidency in the next installment. Bye. Say bye, Khaleesi. Say bye, Khaleesi. She doesn't want to wake up. Bye.